Good evening. Um, my name is Sean Lahar, and I'm an intensive care consultant from Lancashire Teaching Hospitals and alongside Professor Hugh Montgomery, we're chairing a session for our inaugural Innovation Network Forum. A, a brief comment about where it kind of sprung from. Um, both myself and Hugh uh, were coming up with some, or we were being approached with some interesting concepts, especially at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. And there wasn't really an area where people who came up with an idea could go to, to really discuss it and see how we could help develop it. So Hugh suggested at the uh, National Emergency Critical Care, uh, what's the second last C4 committee? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Coronavirus critical care committee. Yeah, I think it's committee. <clears throat> um, but, uh, we should probably start looking at it. And the way intensive care is developing over the last year or so, it's turning into a very different beast than where we started. So uh, I think one of the few good things to come out of this entire sorry mess is, is a, a lot of new innovation that we're seeing around the country. So this is our first session. We've got four uh, fantastic talks with uh, some chat around them. Feel free to put your questions in the um, Q&A or in the chat box. Or, and if you want to link up with them, we will provide their contact details um, when this goes onto the YouTube channel. So um, first up, we've got Leopa. Now, I have to declare a conflict of interest with Leopa. Oh, unless Hugh, did you want to say anything else? Well, I've, I've only briefly comment on, I mean, I don't think I've got much to add, except to say that, you know, this isn't just a talking shop. I mean, I came up with my first, what I thought was quite a smart idea for something in health tech 19 years ago, and it still hasn't reached market. And that's not because I'm particularly lazy or stupid. It's because the system isn't designed for rapid innovation. So the purpose of this forum to a degree is for us to start trying to work out how to do that, to hear the really smart stuff from the smart people, provide input, connect those companies and individuals to the three and a half thousand intensivists for nothing, to let those all engage with their smart ideas, helping people trial things, contribute to protocols, um, assist in trying to get these things through and get them to market. Because if you've got something that's gonna help our patients, we want it out there tomorrow, not in 10 years. And we know it can be done. The Ventura um, Mercedes F1 CPAP device Merv and I and a few others sat around in a common room on a Tuesday evening and we had the first version on Friday morning delivered and it was being used on Monday. So it can be done, but we've got to capitalise, as Sean was saying, on, on uh, we can't revert to the way we were before. We've got to hard bake this. So um, please don't just use this as a feeling that you just got to shoot the breeze. And um, We really want to know how to be engaged to help you deliver speedily to market. So that's all I have to say. Thanks, Sean. Thanks. So we've got four presentations. The first up is Leopa. Now, Leopa are a company, I've got a conflict of interest because I went to them with a, with a problem several years back now, and they have developed a solution to that. So I'm going to let Liam, who's their CEO, and Shravan, who's one of our registrars, discuss what they've done so far. Over to you, Liam. can't hear anything if anyone's talking just to make sure there's no one's accidentally on mute all right that's me apologies uh, it's on mute there uh just can everyone see that yeah we've got it that's great okay so uh yeah so sean says i'm liam mccullen i'm ceo of leopa and i'm joined this evening by uh dr shravan nanda who's an icu clinician in the lancashire health trust I'm going to talk about our uh, Shravi, which is a patient care communications aid that Leopa have been developing um, along with the Lancashire Health Trust uh, and with professors Danny McCauley and Bruno Blackboard in Queen's University in Belfast. Um, I'm going to play a short video now and then I'll follow up with a few slides with a little bit more detail. Um, so. 
Sometimes, the patients struggle to speak to their doctors, nurses and family members. The inability to speak can cause them great stress, isolation and feelings of being trapped or locked in, making health outcomes harder to achieve. For example, many ICU patients have tubes fitted below their vocal cords, tracheostomies, to help with breathing, and some cannot make any sounds. Lip reading can become the go-to for these patients and their health workers. This is frustrating and can result in the wrong messages being communicated. Alongside Lancashire Teaching Hospitals, a company in Belfast called Leopa, which is a spin-out from Queen's University Belfast, has created an app to address this called Stravi. It requires just a mobile phone to use. Stravi can automatically read the patient's lips and figure out what they are trying to say. The application supports a list of predefined phrases and this list can be added to by the user. Crucially, the project received funding from Innovate UK. This has enabled the partners to make significant advancements in automated lip reading technology. It's only because of the advancements in artificial intelligence that this kind of app can work. The app gets better at reading your lip movements the more you use it. Initially, the partners worked together to build the app and show that it could read lips. Now, the app is being trialled with patients across Lancashire Teaching Hospital's critical care department. Sadly, COVID-19 has meant a lot more people have tracheostomies. Just like any patient with a breathing tube, communication is absolutely critical to their mental health and positive health outcomes. So far, feedback has been positive. Yeah, so just to recap, um, Shravi is a, a communications aid for patients with severely impaired speech. Um, we've initially focused on critical care environments. Um, we believe Shravi can facilitate the kind of basic urgent communication between very ill patients and their carers that's needed in those environments. Um, we, uh, th there are many other kind of technology based products on the market today that can help speech impaired people communicate better. Almost all of those are, are grid based where the user selects letters, words and symbols from a grid and then builds up a sentence which can be vocalized. These types of products are really, uh, they're pretty unsuitable for crit critical care environments for a number of reasons. Primarily the patients in ICUs are very unwell and really don't have the manual dexterity to operate one of these devices. And a lot of the devices come with bespoke stands and mounting brackets, which will just simply get in the way in an, a, an ICU environment. Shravi, on the other hand, doesn't require any specialist hardware, just a smartphone or tablet, very little user training. And all the patient really needs to do is move their lips and that allows them to communicate this kind of urgent basic information quickly to their carers. Um, we're currently completing a service evaluation project with patients and staff in, in the Royal Preston ICU. The project was funded by Innovate UK and it was really designed to ascertain if, if Shravi can indeed enhance communications for these speech impaired patients and help them in their long term re rehab. The, the, throughout the, the project, the feedback from the staff and the patients has allowed us to iteratively improve the application, both from an accuracy and a usability perspective. We're currently compiling our kind of end of project report and analysing the feedback, but we do believe that the staff and patients have both benefited from the use of the app. We're also finding, actually, somebody mentioned it earlier, but Shravi can work through uh, one of these CPAP hoods. Um, Going forward, um, we hope to soon be embarking on our next service evaluation project with Bristol Health Trust. Uh, we'd also be very keen to engage with other ICUs and indeed talk to ICU clinicians who might have other ideas as to how we can use Shravi. Um, we very importantly want to evaluate if Shravi can be a vet benefit in other patient types and conditions like um, patients with laryngectomies, MND patients, stroke patients. Um, we actually have a form of the application that can deal with malformed lip movement of the type that you might get in, in a stroke patient, as well as kind of continually looking to improve the, the accuracy um, of Shravi and, and the increasing the vocab that support it. 
We're also looking to develop new features. One of note is a thing we call remote Shravi, which will allow these patients to have a video chat with their with their loved ones at home while while they're in while they're in hospital. Um, lastly, we're, we're using the academic um, health science network to to help market Shravi um, within the NHS. We're also using forums like this, Communications Matters, and, and industry press such as DigitalHealth.net to, to help us get our name out there. We hope to conclude an initial license agreement very soon with, with uh, Lancashire and then use Lancashire as a reference site. Um, we'd obviously like to engage with other health trusts in service evaluation projects, demonstrate hopefully the benefits of Shravi and get it into the hands of, of people that are going to get use out of it. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Right. Well, I'm. I, do, I have to say to start with them, um, I, I don't think anyone's got a conflict here. I think that people are involved in creating new products. That's exactly what we should encourage. We shouldn't view that as a sin or something naughty to have to declare. Uh, even if Shond is making money out of it, that doesn't bother me remotely. So um, I'm going to start by asking a few quick questions and we'll open it to the floor. I mean, I really like this idea. I really, really struggle to lip read. Someone in the comments question is saying, is this better? than humans basically at lip reading. Well, I can tell you anything were better than me. I'm, I'm, I'm dreadful at lip reading. So um, yeah. I, for me, it would be an absolute game changer. I, I think it could be terrific. Um, so quick questions for the floor. First thing, do you need help with further trials? Would this collective group, I see there are 28 of us on the call. We can put this out through the ICS more broadly. Would, would that be useful to you? Do you need more people to help you with exploring its validity and use? Uh, yeah, there's a couple of points. Well, firstly, um, uh, in short, yes, um, there, there's a couple of points. This is a an AI based um, product, so it, it depends on um, a, a breadth of tr of training data, so that we right. can train, train our model. So, the more patients we have, you know, people that are reclined in an ICU with tubes, who are not very well. Uh, mm -hmm. That's in a target cohort. So the more of that, the better. Also, I think if we can, um, you know, we've been using it with tracheostomy patients. Uh, the Bristol trial will again be tracheostomy patients. We're, we're really keen to try to uh, look at other cohorts of patients as well. That that um, um, I know that in in Royal Preston, it's a it's a kind of a neuro uh, ICU. Bristol is kind of non neuro, so. Yeah, patients might be a bit, little bit more alert. So the more kind of types of patients, types of conditions uh, we can get to, the more training data we get, and and the more accurate um, the, the thing will end up being. Good. So, uh, yes, in short. So we can contribute in that way. Um, the, the next question is just a quick one about your um, route to market. Is this going to be something that? Uh, and again, to be clear, there's nothing wrong with things being for profit or even for substantial profit, if, if that's what delivers the innovation, in my view. So what's your what's your plan business wise um, and what do you need to get this out there if it is as effective as it sounds? Um, I think um, we're, we're approaching kind of the NHS um, on a health trust by health trust basis. I think if we can. Um, so so we're, we're looking. I mean, we are a a commercial entity um so uh, you know we do need to try to make some money out of it Good. um so, so we uh we're hoping to get it as i said on size an initial deal with with lancashire kind of use that as a reference site and then look at kind of using that as a springboard to, to try to talk to other health trusts get them well, in so um we're clear for you and for others that follow i mean what i'd like to suggest is that um the, your ask after the presentation is clear. So send us at the Innovation Forum, Shonda, myself, we will disseminate. So what you would like from the community to help you, in this case, trials and how we might help you coordinate those, uh, whether you need access to VC funding or people in relevant industries that might license your product elsewhere, those sorts of things, this network, I think, uh, is well connected to, and there'll be people on this call who are too. So please let us know what we can do to help. Now, uh, other questions then, we've got uh, lots of very helpful comments. A question about whether this could be integrated to medical record systems into an EPR, which I imagine it could, it's going to be a digital signal. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, uh, 
you know, anything today, it's all about just, you know, calling on an API, you know, we'll expose our, our capability through a, an API and, you know, we, we can, act, we can call on any kind of EPR system API. So it's, um, it, it's pretty easy to, you know, exchange data to, you know, from, from different, from system to system. Terrific. Well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm mindful of time. We've, this is so, so exciting. I wouldn't want us to overrun with every call being exciting. So um, I thank you very much for sticking to time. I think that was, I mean, personally, I was hugely impressed. I think the comments we've got in the chat box are there that are impressive. Uh, I'm sure anyone will have waved their hands or, or flagged if they wanted to speak further. But please do give us the list of what you think the ICS and its community can help you with uh, in terms of trials, dissemination, funding connections to industry that, that I, I think that was terrific Liam thank you so much Shonda I'll hand back to you much. for further comments and to introduce our next uh, company no thank you very much you just like to point out I did not make any money out of that <laughs> well but, but it is an important point that there's something there's a general feeling that's somehow sinful to 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 innovate and and to gain profit and i i just want to encourage people that they shouldn't feel embarrassed about saying mm. that there is a revenue stream but there is a there is a, a very clear nhs innovation pathway yeah for people that do create things and go through their trust but don't feel there's a guilty secret here no good tremendous sean never occurred to me um <laughs> right so next up we've got jkm care solutions we've got um paul and i don't know if uh, Josephine is here, um, but they'll be talking about their uh, how their project works. Yeah, unfortunately, Josephina can't make it. She's snowed under in the trust, as so many of us are. <laughs> so you'll have to suffer me. Um, I'm Paul Rylance. I'm the CTO of uh, JKM Care Solutions. And I'd just like to take five minutes of your time to talk about Vidimo. Um, and I'm guessing that the first question is, well, what is Vidimo? Uh, it's a real-time web-based platform that we developed, uh, and it's specifically designed to bring health and care organizations together rather than operating in silo. And this is sort of system-wide thinking. Um, but this evening, because I've only got five minutes, I can barely scratch the surface. Uh, and I'll use ambulance and hospitals, predominantly uh, hopefully focusing on ICU and, and major trauma. Uh, and part of the problem, as I'm sure so many of you are aware, this is a, a South East um, England perspective, and there are 39 locations. And to use current uh, approaches and existing systems would take somewhere in the region of 778 integration points, just so that each other could have visibility of capacity and, and, and share uh, resource. Uh, similarly, um, ambulance trusts have little to no visibility outside of, of the organizational boundaries that are presented. So um, we're trying to overcome this problem by uh, a completely sort of radical uh, and different approach. Uh, and hopefully we can uh, remove the, the, the time and cost problems that are currently incurred. So we're presenting a web-based platform that will allow all locations to be interconnected without the need for integration. And therefore, um, ambulance trusts who, who struggle presently would have real-time visibility of all trusts within their catchment area in real time. And if they wanted specifically to look, let's say, for ICU capacity, that response would be sub one second and it would give them detailed information on every trust that has ICU capacity at that moment in time and if they choose to uh, go to let's say Chell West, um, Chell West instantly in real time then get the message that there's an ambulance en route, how far it is away, it's ETA and uh, the, the severity uh, at least at triage level uh, without going into clinical detail. Um, this, on, on the face of it, doesn't seem huge or significant, but when we start looking at major incidents, real major incidents, like Grenfell, 7-7, uh, Manchester bombing, where multiple ICUs are required, multiple coordination of, of ambulance services, then this then starts to come into its own, and, and we actually have capacity 
for an individual or a single team to coordinate any number of hospitals in a major city that they feel um, fit to do so. And, and when they choose the hospitals, those hospitals are automatically notified that they are participating in a major incident. And when the ambulance, the first ambulance is dispatched, they are then notified that they are now an active participant rather in standby mode. So this removes all the sort of the panic button mentality uh, as happened in 7-7, where literally every trust uh, within London was uh, hitting panic buttons, doing loads of work, initiating sort of internal processes and then realising that they wouldn't be involved. So it's a, a huge amount of effort, and, and that has ramifications for months and months after the fact. So um, I'm hoping you can see that uh, the benefits of a sort of more system-wide approach, and, and one of the um, things that, that came clear at the end of last year was the £400 million spent by the Department of Health and Social Care on additional capacity in... Um, the private healthcare sector. Unfortunately, after, after this deal was secured, it was the clinicians that raised the flag and said, well, we've got no visibility of this capacity. And therefore it went almost uh, unutilized. So what we're offering with Vidimo is the ability to have far greater flexibility, much, much greater visibility in real time across a, a, a very wide geography, it could even be national uh, if needed. Uh, and, and by virtue of the fact that we provide this visibility, it starts to chip away at the manual overheads currently incurred. Just to give you a flavor of that, it's about 2 million staff days that we've identified in our area alone. And that's the equivalent of 9,000 full-time employees. If we could push that amount of manual overhead back to patient-focused care, I, I think it would be a significant um, relief from the front line, um, but also it starts to instill the professional self-worth that's, that's been eroded at some time. I touched on earlier about um, real major incidents and, and we have the ability to coordinate, but I think that the, the closing note for us is um, the improvements that we can uh, make being a web-based application. It's a... Uh, agree once, develop once, deploy once. So even if the, the, uh, the modification or improvement was, let's say, a million pounds, it would be a million pounds for all ICUs to share, rather than going to each ICU and saying, give us a million pounds for the same improvement that we've just developed. So it's real big scale economy of effort, big scale visibility, and uh, we're always looking for champions um, we're hoping we can help health and care come together. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm apologies uh, for my, my brevity and my speed, but lots to get through. This is a very large platform and we're barely scratching the surface. I'll thank you for your time. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Um, Sean, so I don't monopolise things. Uh, I've got a lot of questions, um, but would you like to start? And please, uh, for the floor, uh, we are watching the chat function, so do feel free, free to add, and Sean can pick up those, and so can I. Yeah. So I guess my first question is, how are you delivering that? Are you contracting with hospitals, or are you contracting with networks? You know, for example, during the COVID period, you got had the critical care cells all communicating with each other and declaring where their beds are. Uh -huh. so you're saying that that could be made into a much more efficient, streamlined. Absolutely, this would yeah, this would be a single platform. Everybody could make their capacity visible by default anyway. And if you've reconfigured your hospital as during COVID, so everybody was sort of uh, uh, an Uber ICU. <laughs> Then, then yeah, um, um, same story for electives, same story for rehab centres. Um, it, it, the, the theme is, is sort of common throughout the platform. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah. Okay. we had a, a gas explosion only a couple of days ago, and uh, so uh, it would have been a, a useful thing to have had there. <laughs> yeah, five in the morning is not the time you want to be ringing around hospitals, finding out where the bed spaces are. Absolutely not. Okay. Paul, can I jump in and ask a question quickly? Um, I mean, probably one word answers on this. So firstly, I'm guessing your security and encryption is 
pretty high because this is clearly a, a if this is a national asset it's dangerous to have it too widely exposed to people who shouldn't be seeing it yeah okay. yes <laughs> good the second issue is what are your plans for data mining because this seems to me if you can map all of this it's it fantastically um, there's a fantastic opportunity for improving service efficiency once you can actually map who's traveling where when and how across all boundaries and where they're going and what the capacities are your efficiency opportunities are colossal aren't they oh so they're, they they are they're, they're, i couldn't even pretend to put a figure on it and yeah. i've had a conversation this afternoon with um a, a supplier that does rotor scheduling yeah. And by virtue of the fact that if somebody has a care package at home and during the night they have to go to uh, A and E, yeah. at the moment there's no way to tell the community or dom care people that they shouldn't be going to that house the next day. Right. And our system would do that automatically for them without any user intervention. We we can we could code it so that it will just put out a message to say please don't go to this house today. There's no reason to. And, and, and just to echo Sean's comments, I mean, you know, again, I, I, this sounds wonderful and piecemeal sales will be very difficult. I mean, you really need to get whole networks to buy product, don't you? Um, and certainly our experience with COVID in my section or central London, um, this would have really, really helped because we were having to have multiple multi-cell phone calls every day mm -hmm. the day everyone's dialing in what have you got what have you got to move what's your capacity um yeah. there are some questions in the box there um are you working with las in phase one of their project i don't know which project that would be but and phase one of it but are you familiar with that uh, we're not familiar with the project itself but we have tried reaching out to las on a number of occasions and we continue to try but um, traction has been quite slow. I'll be. I'll be honest. Okay. So that's again in questions of of the ask of ICS. Uh, you might put that to us more formally. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've got Roger, um, someone who's managed major tech projects. What recognition for usual organ um, um, recognition for usual organisational barriers? I. How do you get people engagement into this? I suppose that's the question at the bottom line. How, how do you get yeah, that, that has been a major, major challenge for us. Um, and I think historically, the, the healthcare industry, uh, when they look at challenges and problems, they're particularly clinical ones, they're quite focused on a, a specific condition or a, a small group of conditions. Right. This is much bigger. This is, this is very, very broad. And, and it operates at also at ICS level. And, and we've struggled to get uh, engagement with the very senior levels of, of NHS, but I think that's what's needed to, to gain good traction. And we're reaching out to ICSs now that they're starting to mature and solidify a bit. Okay. Sean, over, back to you again. Have you other questions or comments? No, I'm just very cautious of the time. I want to make sure everyone gets a chance. Oh. I think we're going to leave it there because I can't see any more questions. Oh, one. I guess, how would you integrate that data into an EPR system? Um, well, we, we're looking that the, most of the data we hold is not patient sensitive data. We only hold the NHS number as a reference point. We can quite happily integrate with EPR systems if required, but it, it's, uh, it's understanding what that requirement would be. Right. That makes sense. Terrific, Paul. Well, again, thank you so much. I mean, that was really impressive. And do please follow up um, with what we can do to help you. Um, thank you. Shond, back to you, sir. So, moving on, we have Marcella uh, Vizcay-Chippy. I hope I, hope I pronounced that right. Who, it's okay, yes, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> works at Chelsea and Westminster. So, uh, far ahead. Okay, brilliant. So, let me just share my screen. Mm -hmm. So it's a problem, a technical issue. Okay, that is good. It's not. 
Um, if there's a problem, we can swap things. You can email it to me and I can see if I can present it from here. That would be another way round if we hit the barriers. Okay, this is very unusual. So... Yeah, and it sometimes happens, doesn't it, that you get these glitches. Yeah, really. Um, all panelists, uh, you can start. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So while I'm trying to get this, apology for this. Actually, um, I've just changed the sharing options as well. There seem to be some advanced sharing options that might have helped. I don't know if that has. It might be worth one more go. Can you see that? No, it's not going, isn't it? The system blocked my presentation, basically. So. Well, what do we want to do, Shonda? I mean, I've, I've just put my email into the box there and that's one option. I've done that when my computer's failed and emailed okay, someone else. Yeah, I can so... always try and present for you and you can just say next slide, please. And that might okay. work. Let me just copy it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, well, let's see if I worth a go. It's interesting. The mic, the the WhatsApp, the the WhatsApp, the the link is completely blocked, so I'm not sure why. I think what we'll do is we'll move on to the next presentation and we'll come back to Marcella. If you yeah, can okay, I'm so sorry, uh, I don't know why is the problem. That's fine, don't worry. And you can always uh, email it to me if you can in the meantime, and I can always share it for you, that's yeah, fine. I'm just problem. sharing as well by email, yeah. That's, thank Lovely you. Job, yeah. So, uh, Being the presentation by email, and I'll present it for you in a minute. All right, Sean, on to number four then, which I think is X events, isn't it? Yes, it is indeed. Uh, and we've got Professor Grocott talking about something that seems remarkably like something I experienced, or well, I didn't personally experience, but 50 years ago, I had a very mm. similar device out. Mike. Uh, hang on, I'm just trying to get the sharing right. Same. Good, Mike. We saw the deck anyway. Okay. Yep, we're there. Uh, and then tell me if you can see the slide or... or um... We've got slide and the presentation on the left hand side. So we've got your, that's go. the one. We've got your notes as well, but we can put up with that. There you go. How's that? Yeah, that's cool. Now you just go. got the slide, yeah? Even better. Yeah. Fantastic. So um, thank you so much for the opportunity to um, present at the IC, ICS Innovation Network Forum. Um, and uh, I have to admit, I feel a little bit like a sort of bogus parent trying to pass off someone else's child because this is not my innovation um but i was uh, i've been a, an admiring observer since close to the beginning and then i was um brought in really to look at evaluation uh, quite a long way down the journey <clears throat> but it's a, a pleasure to be able to present it and i guess the third thing to say is that although this um is a project born out of the uh, extraordinary uh, stresses and um, challenges of COVID, uh, I don't think it's a COVID specific project in any way. Uh, and I think what, what our true burning platform is, is the <clears throat> management of pneumonia uh, more broadly and, and a whole variety of other uh, respiratory challenges, but particularly acute pneumonia, which as I think we all know has a huge burden in terms of mortality and associated morbidity, uh, and particularly a burden in children. And uh, one aspect of that is that um, modern treatment of pneumonia in uh, wealthy countries involves uh, fancy and expensive intensive care units and uh, fancy and expensive ventilators which require uh, a lot of money to buy them and a lot of uh, technical expertise to, to drive them and that those facilities are often not available in low and middle income countries and that is uh, almost certainly not unrelated to the fact that most of the deaths from pneumonia and childhood pneumonia in particular occur in those countries. Now, uh, as Sean has perceptively pointed out, this, this may not be the most original idea in terms of the notion of negative pressure ventilation, but I think uh, hopefully you will see that there are some uh, important 
uh, innovations that make it perhaps a, a slightly different game now. Uh, I mean, the, the whole notion was around from the 19th century, uh, negative pressure ventilators were in common use uh, from the late 1920s onwards, right through to the 50s. And we're very familiar with the, the classic images of polio, as you can see here. Uh, if you were lucky enough not to get the medical student, then you got a negative pressure ventilator. Um, although I guess you'd probably be pretty grateful to have a medical student. And then, and then as positive pressure uh, ventilation was introduced, negative pressure ventilation, sorry, you can now see the picture, I guess, the negative pressure, pressure ventilation uh, fell by the wayside. Um, but it's interesting to reflect on why that change took place. And, and I think uh, many of the reasons related to uh, the practicalities of the, the scale and form of the devices uh, and the practicalities of nursing care, rather than the sort of uh, evidence that we'd require today in terms of is, is there a, an effectiveness benefit for the patient? So, so I don't think that question was particularly asked at the time. They were thought to be essentially equivalent and one of them was, was a lot easier to deal with. And there are theoretical reasons for uh, questioning whether the negative pressure ventilator may in fact be superior to positive pressure ventilation. Uh, and we certainly know that there are adverse outcomes associated with positive breath pressure ventilation, particularly uh, ventilator associated lung injuries, also ventilator associated pneumonias, the uh, inhibitory effect on cardiac output, uh, and I won't go through the, the physiology of that here, and the requirement for uh, other interventions, notably uh, frequently sedation and, and uh, from time to time paralysis in order to maintain a patient in a comfortable state attached to a mechanical ventilator uh, and intubated. And I think the theoretical benefits of ne uh, negative pressure ventilation are that uh, one can make a case that ne natural breathing, if you like, so we, we normally breathe through negative pressure through the movement of the thoracic cage, uh, may be more physiological. And there's robust, robust evidence that negative pressure is less likely to cause microtrauma in the lungs, less likely to call al cause alveolar hemorrhage uh, and probably viral replication, uh, it tends to increase rather than decrease cardiac output. And that, those, are, those are nuanced things that require careful study. Uh, it, it's fairly self-evident. It doesn't require intubation uh, because of the physical characteristics. And it has this interesting uh, characteristic that it separates the gas supply from the gas exchange. So your, your ventilation is not driven by the passage of gas in and out of the chest it's driven entirely separately from that. So you can mechanically ventilate someone who's breathing air, or you can use a variety of forms of supplemental gas. And so I guess the X-Event is a reinvention of classical iron lungs. It's ultra light, very efficient, uh, only in cases uh, the torso. It's low power usage, so it can be on mains, but also can be battery powered. It doesn't require any driving gases, uh, and therefore it, it's a kind of classic intermediate technology. Uh, and potentially of, of great value in low and middle income countries and in that it's low cost, simple to manufacture. Uh, and, and in the context of COVID had the added advantage that it wasn't really competing for the same types of components that were uh, bunging up the supply chain for the uh, positive pressure ventilators. Uh, I'm gonna put the patient experience first and I put it inverted commas because uh, the, the patients so far have been enthusiastic uh, doctors and investigators and nurses rather than uh, patients, but the uh, subjective experience is uh, said to be very comfortable, relaxing, there's certainly no requirement for sedation, you can talk, you can cough in the expiratory phase, uh, and the use, unit can be used in a, in a number of different orientations for the patient, and they can be drinking and eating and moving and communicating. From a medical perspective, uh, negative pressure ventilation essentially does almost everything that positive pressure ventilation does and the types of controls are very similar. Uh, although there's, there's the uh, interesting um, difference that in order to trans uh, transfer from just continuous negative extrathoracic pressure, CNEP, which is the equivalent of CPAP, to ventilation, you don't need to do anything dramatic like intubate someone. You, you simply alter the controls on the machine. Um, this separation of the um, airway gases from the process of ventilation is itself interesting because it reduces the requirement for any extraneous or indeed pressurized gases. So a simple oxygen concentrator could suffice for the oxygen supplementation required uh, for many sick patients 
uh, whilst they're receiving ventilatory support. And that obviously as an intermediate technology solution is very appealing. Um, it would work with domiciliary oxygen. There's almost certainly less risk of aerosol, aerosolization and droplet transmission. Um, and uh, we think the risk of pneumothorax is, uh, is very low. From a nursing perspective, um, certainly the nurses that we've had involved with this project and they've been central to the development uh, are uh, very pro the notion that it's, it's easy to handle, it's easy to clean, it's easy to prone patients in it, communication is better, uh, and the, um, the controls are very straightforward. Uh, I will uh, close relatively quickly in order to give some time for questions, but um, to emphasize, so this has been a charitable endeavor. There are, there's been a lot of sharing of knowledge and there are parallel uh, initiatives coordinated by the Exavent Group in the UK. And uh, um, I'll tell you a little bit more about them in a moment, but there are parallel initiatives in several places around the globe that are proceeding in parallel using Exavents from relevant local materials. Uh, and, and indeed uh, in some uh, places actually getting a little bit ahead of the UK team. So in Bangladesh and Ghana, they're already doing some patient volunteer testing. The uh, team itself uh, would be, in some respects, a more interesting topic for presentation than the, the X event itself, which I do think is a fascinating product. There's the extraordinary energy and application of uh, some very senior engineers and medics entirely voluntarily over a long period of time. Uh, that have been publishing and innovating and working with different companies uh, and have, have got to where they are now, which is the current status, which is we've got an agreed trial protocol ready to go to MHRA. Um, we're very happy to act as the uh, principal centre for the trial, but there will be other centres involved as well. Uh, and I'm at the moment taking the role of chief investigator, but I have to say that's on behalf of uh, a really great team in Southampton. And what we're looking for is, is funding to, to get those clinical trials going, not least because for a regulatory approval study, we need uh, a, a clinical research organisation and that comes with a, a cost. So, so our trust and indeed most trusts will, would struggle for this type of device to do that type of study without, without an independent CRO. Um, we, we are actively seeking funding from a variety of other sources um, uh, nationally and internationally. So we've had some uh, conversations with the Gates Foundation, but at the moment, this is uh, our stalling point. So I will leave it there. Um, hopefully you've found this notion that we might be about to reintroduce the iron lung, but in modern dynamic form, uh, intriguing, and I'd be delighted to ask and answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, Shonda, I'll let you start picking up on that as I download our next presentation, which is at my email box. So let me be doing that while we're sort of ready for the next one. Thank you, Mike. That's fascinating. It's like, it's like how you, I mean, it's taking the principles of what we did then and, and turning it into a modern day uh, version. And it, it is fascinating. Can I ask? What, when you say they're using native materials, what do you mean by that? Uh, so I, I don't know all the, the details of what's going on in Bangladesh, and it might be better if one of, one of the other uh, collaborators jumps in. But, but uh, I guess what I, the, the basic principle is, if you work to the designs, uh, you, you need um, a driving unit and a control unit, but, but exactly what you make the box, to be simplistic about it, out of, and even the seals, there is a degree of flexibility on. Now, as uh, you know, once obviously that, that gets more complex when you get into regulatory approval and, and, and what exactly what was approved, but certainly at this evaluation stage, um, that there are a, a variety of very closely related but but distinct approaches being taken. I, David, I don't know if you want to jump in on that, if you're able to speak. Well, we have uh, senior engineers on the call, actually, people like Neil and uh, Dave McCowan and so on, but essentially uh, the Ghana team made it out of plywood and uh, with very simple seals. Uh, and uh, those of you who do any diving will know that uh, various types of neoprene and so on can be used as very effective seals. And those materials are available all over the world. The Bangladesh team are truly ahead of us and about to start their clinical trial and presented to their MHRA. And they're using a composite material, very lightweight composite material. And there are a huge variety of plastics and polymers that could be used. And again, just what is available locally. The Bangladesh team have somebody in them who is an expert boat builder. 
well, imagine the materials available to produce boats. So um, the engineers on the call could give you a, a six hour version of what I've just said. So I, I'm going to just chip in to offer this my support. And, and David, you and I spoke early on in this process as well last year. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with this sort of negative pressure technology, um, I was probably one of the last people to work on Lane Fox when it was full of iron lugs, cuirasses, negative pressure ventilators of all sorts. Um, it is a different experience for patients and it is a better experience for patients. So um, rather than having a tight fitting CPAP mask on, which stops you doing anything like eating, drinking, talking, and the moment you take it off, it causes trouble. These negative pressure systems can maintain a really good FRC. And of course, that's where the gas exchange happens. So you can maintain a very good FRC with supplemental oxygen breathing at the top end. And it means you can also drink and talk and do all those other things that you can't do with a tight fitting mask attached to you. Um, the comfort is significant. Mike alluded to the cardiac issues, which I think we've all become rather inured to. We just accept that the circulation is the way it is. It's only when you see negative pressure applied that you realize it can be different. So I wouldn't want people on this call to think this is some antiquated technology being cobbled together for loose and low income countries because they can't afford the right thing. Uh, my strong impression is this could be um, a game changer for everything else that we do as well. So I suppose the question to you and Mike is, what can we do to help? Um, do we need to find the money? Uh, we've got a reasonable network of high net worths now that have supported the ICS in the last year. Do we need to start helping with that? Or do we need to try to uh, link you to other commercial supporters? Or what would you like us to do for you, David and Mike? In terms of commercial supporters, um, we now have Portsmouth Aviation on board. We have originally had Marshall Aerospace and Portsmouth Aviation have been brilliant and are soaking up the costs. We've done something around about three million pounds worth of work so far for nothing. But as Mike alluded to, we have reached a point now, we, we do need 350,000 pounds. And the whole idea of negative pressure uh, does take some explaining and does take mm. people to understand and feel that it's worthwhile. And so far, we have not been able to raise that substantial amount. Well, look, I think, David, again, same ask as the other ones. I mean, please send that to us at the ICS. That's not just, it's just not the Hugh and Sean show. Um, we're just the servants of the th three and a half thousand people who work there. So send it to us and we'll see what we can do. I mean, that's that's all we can say. Let, let's see whether we can get this off the ground. I, you know, I personally would like to, heaven forbid I should fall ill. I, I like the concept of being in negative pressure, having worked with it before. Uh, I think we've forgotten how good it could be. Um, Thank you. We, we really appreciate your opportunity and I'll leave you to speculate how it is that you saw the iron lung in its latter days and still have your own hair colour and I've gone completely grey. But there we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all out of the bottle, Michael. Good. Um, well, look, thank, thank you. you so much, um, Mike and team and, and David. Um, I think we should probably, Sean, do you think, move on to our last presentation? I, I think so, yes. We're, we're, we're Terrific. In which case, time, I think. and share screen, uh, which I hope is working there or will be soon. Uh, and if I do that, hopefully you can see my screen, can you? You can see someone's screen. That's, <laughs> that's fine, Hugh. We have good in which case, uh, Marcella, you just say next slide, please, and I will click the button. And if you're talking, you're on mute. Hugh, do you want to go full screen on the slides? I thought I had. Maybe Marcella's on. I'm, I am as full screen as I can be. If I move down, is that me moving it there? I think it's Marcella's screen which is sharing. At the moment. In which case, Marcella, it's over to you in that case. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. And sorry about all the technical issues. Technology for you. And uh, funny enough, I am on my NHS computer. So it's working. That's good. So, I am uh, Marcella Vizcaichipi, one of the intensive care consultants from Chelsea. And unfortunately, I don't have anything innovative to share with you today. I think it's more about the approach to innovation 
in the context of uh, uh, our digital world and as using all these tools as a means to, uh, to acquire information and standardize the way that we acquire information in order to develop uh, our products and uh, our systems uh, more robust for the future. So in a, in a nutshell, I will go a bit of around backgrounds, some facts, understanding of systems that most of you know about these things, uh, issues, the implications of introducing new technology, um, building, and the type of data we generate, and what we as an organization can do together moving forward. So this is a classic uh, illustration. And when I talk about foundations, we can see here, there's a bit of a foundation, there's an structure going on, and uh, in time, that becomes a building. And of course, we have more structures and the beautiful castles. This is the Buckingham Palace in the 1700s, and this is sand castles who doesn't like to build them when we are on holidays. So data, data science is basic, basically population health can be built on foundations or without foundations. And when it comes to innovation and bringing multiple parties to work with us in the national health system, we need to think about the foundation of our system, of our hospitals. So we need to think about the IT, the data warehouse, we need to think about devices integration and the connectivity. So yes, agree, we need to keep developing, but we need to keep in mind what is underneath. So we know that research is everybody business and that is very clear set by the, says in the NHS constitution. We used to collect data in multiple databases. We also replicate our databases. Uh, kind of makes sense because until recently, and still some hospitals are on paper. So it makes sense that researchers develop their own databases in order to manage the, the information and uh, carry on investigating uh, or trying, carry on answering key questions. Uh, but unfortunately, we lack of real-time data. And this is a main issue. We all work together and we collect data for ICNARC and say NELA, PICWIC, main, name it, multiple national organizations. And but the data is retrospective data. So when it comes to making clinical decisions, it's a bit too late. Few lives are lost in the process when we talk about pandemics, like the one that we are living. And, but when we talk about voice recognition a patient communicating with the psychology, it would be quite nice to see the information going to the patient's records or in the patient's diary. So this is the way that I try to see the data. There are a few facts that we need to take into consideration. Uh, fact number one, we have multiple ICU clinical pathways. Patients come from different backgrounds. You know, from the emergency department, from theaters, maternity, other healthcare providers come from pediatric ICU, adult wards, there are different levels of patients. And then the patients end up going home, nursing home, tertiary center, medical surgical wards. And you can see when we bring innovation, there are different points of entry for our patients but somehow the data need to follow. And in here, I haven't put on the slide, but it's one component of the patients that don't make it. Again, the pathway need to be developed and we need to be innovative and creative in the way that we capture that data so it flows. So the second fact, the ICU is a complex environment. We know that. And we got multiple devices around the patients. And one of the key, if you can see, there is a, I have to circle it because there is a nurse 
trying to look after the patient, and at the same time, capturing all this information. So we gather around, say, 30,000 data points per patient a day and do the numbers by the number of patients that we see normally. So a lot of data coming from different devices. So something to think. So uh, with that, that takes take us to the next level about systems. We interview system, we come up with new ideas about solutions of ongoing problems. But how we get these ideas together. So uh, when we talk about uh, the different process of thinking in here, we got a minimalist approach or kind of holistic approach. Sometimes we got a question that we want to answer and we make a complex system, a simple system, so we understand it. But the problem, we miss or lose the granularity of the information that allow us to move patients to the next level. So we need to think about control systems and processes. And I know it's at the end of the day and I lose a few minutes with technical issues. So I will move straight away into the two systems that are of interest to us in the intensive care unit. One is the open loop systems that very simple, there is a timer, there is an illustration, say this is a toaster and the outcome it is toast. And we are disturb the system, so we interfere with it. That is a reason it's an open system. So proxim proximity to the heating elements, heat up time, et cetera, et cetera. So there is clear interaction of us with the system. Then we have closed loop systems. Hmm. That's what we're thinking of when we got a lot of data from patients and shall we close the system, introduce decision support tools. We need to think carefully. So when we talk about closed loop system, again, the same process, but in here, we got the forward path and we got the feedback path. And in the middle is the black box. And that is what we need sometimes to think carefully and when we want to activate, if we want to activate. To open loop systems, the physiological data goes to the patients, physiological model tuning to patient. We a bit more of physiological model patient simulation, so we understand what is going on. We simulate the results, calculate some information that need to go, like uh, calculate ventilatory advice or identify preventable complications. That goes to the clinicians clinician interfere in the system, modified a ventilator, for instance, and the loop follows. So we got an integrative approach to care, and we still have control of the situation. That's nice, but that takes us to fact number three. We don't have enough, or in fact, there is an absence of modern IT system in high equity care. We know that we got medical students collecting data during the pandemic to help us to report to NARC in some organizations. So there are suboptimal processes. There is poor level of data and we keep generating data. And as I said, our reporting to national organizations are in retrospective. So not sure how beneficial it is moving forward. So the other implications or handling data is the data that comes with the patient before arriving to hospital, arriving to the emergency department, from the emergency department to the wards, ICU and following ICU. Okay, as you can see, what I'm trying to highlight here, we don't work in isolation anymore. And most of you have been highlighting all the wonderful activities that we can do together and somehow the data need to follow. So for that, we need to get a better understanding of a network. So when we talk about introducing an innovative approach to care, we it's just not a piece of tool that will benefit the patient. It's how the information that comes from that piece of tool will fit into the system. For that, we need to think at local level, like intensive care, so clinical data, 
but then the admin, electronic medical records, and what is the structure or infrastructure of our hospitals and of our intensive care units. Because without the infrastructure, the technology can be wonderful, but then there is no Wi-Fi for us to actually to, uh, to, to use the tools that we just developed. So we just, uh, last year we opened part of our intensive care unit where we got, we thought very carefully and we got integrated computer 44 inches so patients can actually communicate through that or watch the news or do exercise or so on. And we inform them, keep educated and uh, we introduce a bit of technology around since to the CW Plus, that is our local charity, and that allow us to stream data. But when we talk, we all have this data actually. You don't need a fancy intensive care unit. We all gather data about vital signs, we lab results, we got continuous monitoring from the monitors, we got lab, lab results, we got CT scan, we go the reporting that we generate for uh, uh, for external organizations. So what I'm trying to illustrate in this slide that we go regular sampling, low frequency, high frequency, irregular sampling. So the data that we start gathering or we gather day to day can be a simple data or complex data. So when we talk about simple data, what I try to say is a structured data. It's a data that is very simple to extract on a table and analyze and come up with a nice modeling that will advise us. But that is not good enough. What we need a bit of to get a bit of hands on on the unstructured data. Unstructured data is when a, a document that is scanned into an EPR system can be actually decodified by identifying keywords or key phrases and then structure. So there are hospitals in the country that are for trust actually that are using this type of system. And, uh, and that probably is the way forward where we combined all the information from the patient to start modeling. And that the innovative approach to care is not only new technology, but how the new technology help us to improve patient's care. And this uh, information for this graph that I put here that follows uh, shaping the, uh, the healthcare system uh, workshop that we have with Think Tank. Uh, and these are the points that the mass adoption, we talk about accessing data, self-care. So how we integrate the information that comes from the community, from our wearables, we all monitor our sleep, we monitor our uh, physical activity. So all of that information, how we integrate into the patient's own records and how we move that forward. So I want to give you some example that all of this is possible. We have done it in the middle of the pandemic. We use real-time data with updates every 10 minutes that we could see patients. This is anonymized data. We saw patients uh, at a trust level, hospital level, world level, and, uh, and we could actually, in a very simple way, could identify a number of patients by gender, by sex, the locations, and number of patients that were infected or not. We also we put some decision support tools, in some analytics in real time, and that gets updates every 10 minutes, where we could actually predict the patient's arrays or uh, 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 medium risk, or high risk, or suspected risk of thromboembolic events, for instance, or cytokine symptoms or infections. And that allowed us to modify, modify our treatment in real time. And this is real patient, and the, the information was updated every 10 minutes. Another example of using real time data is using the patient's own records to predict the own risk is when we introduce the predicting me, uh, model to predict the patients that needed to come to ICU from the emergency department, the risk of death of those patients, patient needed, uh, needed uh, mechanical ventilation. So 
this is possible that help initially helped us operationally to, to identify resources uh, and staff the wards or intensive care units and also clinically to, to patients that we were borderline or hesitant. So it is possible for us to actually to optimize and build the foundations to use our own data to actually to improve patient's care. But the key is what we do next. So first we need to think about the way that we document. In the future with the technology, with the data science, we probably will not even need to think about standardization. But in the meantime, we need to define what we want to capture and then we can think about how we capture it. Uh, but not only at local level, but perhaps driven by our society, I was thinking that perhaps it's about time that we join forces with the Euro European Data Science Collaboration Group with the, the American Data Science Collaboration Groups. They already join forces because if we define how we want our data, what type of data, then the source of truth is exactly the same, doesn't matter where we are. So the key is in 2050, where we want to be, to have, we build the foundations like Buckingham Palace, it will be there. The sand castles may not be there. So it's our decision how we build our foundations so we get all those innovative projects up and running and live in years to come. Okay, this is me. And what I want to show, these are some of the useful resources that uh, uh, we tend to navigate and organizations that help us somehow to, to shape, to share, uh, 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 and help us to build in a way the digital world. Because all this technology that we are or innovative approach to care are the means for us to improve care. So we just need to find a way to kind of put the things together. And this is what I, I wanted to share that today because we are in a unique position. We learn to share. We realize that we don't live in silos anymore. So it's a great opportunity for us all to be part of this change. And this is me. So if you've got any questions. That's fantastic. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid we're a bit short on time, but uh, I guess uh, there is a question from one of the from one of the uh, members uh, within the wider NHS organisation. Is there scope for patient-initiated sponsored innovation projects? Is a much wider question. Yeah. I think there should be. Yeah, it should be. So basically, there is a, a patient's impact group that they review all the innovative approach to care, any new technology or device. We, there is a, a, the recovery group that is a platform basically in Northwest London, and that actually are volunteers that sit on that platform, and they are as uh, normally they are approached to, to review new technology and see how that can fit in their life. And um, perhaps it's something that we need to think about how we do more widely that type of activities because it's extremely important to hear their voices when it comes to introduce changes, yeah. I think as a, as a wider challenge, that's a, it's something yeah. the, the intensive care community and probably NHS need to follow up. I mean, normally patients would either approach their maybe their departments, but quite often through charities about how they can come up with innovations that may may help. Um, it's a very good question. Yeah. Does anybody else have an opinion on that? Or... No? Okay. Um, I think we've uh, come to the end of this session. Um, so uh, I'm aware we're 10 minutes over time. Sorry, Hugh, you're back again. 
No, that's not. I was muted to let you get the stage. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll let you close, Sean. But I uh, thank everyone for turning up. This is our first go. I, I think this has got legs. Um, I'd send Sean the message just now. I think we need to grow this community. We need the innovators there. I think we should extend it out to early stage. So those smart ideas or where there's a need without a solution potentially and in including patients. And I'm gonna start talking to Sean and others about whether we can start getting venture capital to listen in as well, and maybe policymakers as well, to try to link people up to speed up this innovation and in getting to patients. Uh, I, I think there's some clear strands that we brought from just from this talk. You know, both the Marcella's uh, project and JKM's care, both both those are very dependent on a kind of integrated data system that clearly is a challenge at the moment. Um, you know, and innovations or recycling of innovations that occurred from a while ago, you know, the, the, the use of a negative pressure system to, that is probably physiologically more beneficial for patients, I think is a, is a fascinating thing. Yeah? And, 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 and the lip reading technology we've got. So we really do need to find a way, and we're hoping that this community and the people that come on it can help us shape a way of, of ensuring that if you need funding, we can get you resources for funding. If you need it, information disseminating, we can do that. And engaging with, with not just the, the clinicians and, and all the other uh, professionals that work within the community, but also with the patients and the public that, that do watch these kind of sessions. So um, I'd just like to thank all the speakers for taking time out in, in an evening to, for talking uh, and the people that have been listening for um, yeah. joining in. And th thank you for the questions. I agree. Thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. OK, we will be putting this out on um, YouTube probably by the end of this week or next week. OK, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks thank for everything. Bye.